okay, here we go. This is this part two of the reading and commentary on the work criticizing the Second International and the Marxist revisionists, basically for their position on anti-Semitism and what they call the Jewish question. Okay. So let's continue. Not here. Yes. And here we go. Finally, Bernstein and Kautsky could have raised possible misgivings about Mehring's stance on anti-Semitism and the Jews with him personally. Yet neither of them seems to have done so. Had Mehring's stance generally been as ex exceptional as most of the literature suggests, this would be hard to explain. It is against this background that we need to examine the proof text enlisted well nigh, well nigh universally to demonstrate that Mehring's stance on philo-Semitism was supposedly not only exceptional, but even criticized publicly within the party. Bernstein's Das Schlagswort and Der Antisemitismus, the catchphrase and antisemitism. A closer look at this warning against the use of the catchphrase philo-Semitism that supposedly cautioned the Social Democratic Party against ambiguity of language and attitude in the Jewish question is well worth the effort. The text is in fact a review article. It is my task, <clears throat> excuse me. It is my task, Bernstein began, to review three publications dealing with the Jewish or some might argue the so-called Jewish question. According to the terminology widely accepted in the socialist press to these publications would have to be classified to the effect that two of them are anti-Semitic, while the third is distinctly philo-Semitic. Somehow, I am just not comfortable with this juxtaposition, though, and I have decided, partly in order to develop the reasons for my diverging opinion, partly since it strikes me as being an issue of current interest anyway, to combine this review with a discussion of a number of aspects not always given sufficient consideration in the assessment of anti-Semitism. Although the juxtaposition of anti and philo-Semitism is indeed the single most important theme running through Bernstein's article, it also touches on numerous other issues. Bernstein repeatedly deployed anti-Jewish stereotypes, sometimes ironically, sometimes in earnest, to underscore his critique of the authors at hand. Quote, if it is really a principle of quote unquote Jewish commerce to put quantity and cheap showmanship before quality, he mocked in one instance, then Herr Waldhausen's text is indeed an example for the contagiousness of a bad example. The shallowest Viennese a Juden Literat could not have worked less conscientiously. Bernstein concludes, resorting to another anti-anti-Semitic line of argument popular at the time, Bernstein contended that even based on only moderately sound judgment, anyone who read Walhausen's publication in an unprejudiced manner had to conclude that, quote, that the Jews could not possibly have wrecked all the havoc he ascribes to them unless they had become involved with spiritually and morally totally depraved peoples. Well, one of the issues discussed by the other anti-Semitic publication under review 
was the fact that when charged to appear in court, Jews were more likely than non-Jews to be acquitted. Bernstein criticized the author of the pamphlet for using this merely as proof for the greater slyness and scrupulousness, etc., of the Jews. Unquote. A number of objections to this line of reasoning spring to mind, the most obvious being that of those dragged before the courts. The Jews are really often innocent of the charges brought against them than the non-Jews. After all, in a social climate pervaded by anti-Jewish sentiments, it would hardly be surprising if unfounded accusations were leveled at Jews with some frequency and non-Jews reason that they might be able to enlist the legal system to contain the effects of Jewish emancipation. Yet, to Bernstein's mind, it was quite right to reject any such blanket interpretation of the larger percentage of acquitted Jews in their favor. What was, quote-unquote, simply ridiculous, though, was to, quote, attach the stigma of moral guilt to all those acquitted, unquote. But simply, the suggestion that Jews are generally acquitted because they manipulate this system is unproblematic. Problematic is only the attempt to deny that occasionally Jews do get off because they are generally innocent. It is only when turning to the third publication under review that Bernstein began to address the issue of philosemitism. There were, in fact, Bernstein began two different types of philosemitism. The first type implied, quote, merely a certain sympathy for the Jews that rules out neither a condemnation of notorious mistakes nor a repudiation of their presumptuousness where it shows itself, unquote. The other type, by contrast, amounted to obsequiousness towards capitalist money jewelry, support of Jewish chauvinism, glossing over injustices perpetuated by Jews and loathsome characteristics developed by Jews, unquote. While the latter was obviously unacceptable, the former was legitimate, Bernstein conceded. The merely at the beginning of the formulation clearly indicates, though, that Bernstein felt defensive, even about this mild, acceptable form of philosemitism. With their critical remarks directed against philosemitism, socialists risk tarring both types of philosemitism with the same brush, and thus playing into the hands of the anti Semites. Bernstein then explained. For the latter applied the term indiscriminately to everyone who will not subscribe to their unconditional condemnation of the Jews and their demand that the Jews be deprived of their rights. It was this, Bernstein went on, that led him to, quote, to question the wisdom of granting them a certain legitimacy by using the term in the way outlined above. <clears throat> hmm. No legitimacy from Bernstein, huh? Okay. He directed his remarks explicitly at those who, for um, quote unquote, very commendable reasons, were the most frequent critics of philo Semitism in the party, namely the comrades of Jewish descent, who, precisely because they are of Jewish extraction, consider it their special duty to spare the party any suspicion of aiding and abetting Begangestung. <laughs> consider it their special duty to spare the party any suspicion of aiding and abetting Jewish interests. Oh, you saw the usage of this ambiguous catchword, quote, which the anti-Semites use in a completely different sense from the social democrats, was not, however, the right way of realizing this wish. It, quote, can be better and more effectively underscored, unquote, by referring to the genuine other extreme opposed to anti-Semitism, namely pan-Semitism. Anti-Semitism and pan-Semitism stood against one another as Slavophobia and pan-Slavism do. Quote, we are as determined in our opposition to the former as we know ourselves free of the latter. 
Bernstein added in a slightly ambiguous formulation, leaving it open whether he was referring primarily to matters Slavic, Semitic, or both. The analogy Bernstein introduced here is surely a remarkable one. Pan-Slavism may ultimately have proved a phantom, rendering the harsh rejection and resentment it provoked from Marx and Engels and much of mainstream Western socialism quite disproportionate. Yet it was a self-avowed and self-styled ideology that actually existed. The image of anti-Napoleonic coalition troops entering Paris in March 1814 with Tsar Alexander I at their helm was firmly etched into the consciousness of European Democrats and radicals. For them, it epitomized Russia's role as the stalwart of reactionary politics in Europe. Hence the prompt rejection by Marx and Engels and their collaborators around the Naya Rheinische Zeitung, the New Rhine River paper of the Pan-Slav ideology. The rejection of this Pan-Slav ideology and movement from its very inception during the revolution of 1848-1849. Far from initiating some novel form of animosity, this rejection cemented an already habitual distrust towards Russia, firmly established among European progressives. This is borne out not least by the fact that distinctly non-Marxist and anti-Marxist strands of Western socialism were subsequently no less partial to this habitual distrust. Okay, I'm going to take a break now. Okay, let's continue. Let me bring you over to the page here. As is well known, <laughs> a lot of assumptions are made here about previous readings. Uh, I should perhaps explain what the term philo-Semitism refers to. Philo is the Greek term for loving, loving Semites or Semitism in Europe. <clears throat> Semitism being an Oriental culture was uh, rather perverted. Okay, so we continue. As is well known, the imperial German government consciously and very successfully sought to capitalize on this distrust in the immediate run-up to World War I, when insisting against the increasingly impatient military leadership that Russia must, under all circumstances, be seen to declare war first. Yeah, sounds like Ukraine. In the event, the deeply ingrained Russophobia, in fact, sufficed with the bulk of social democracy to convince itself that it was facing a war of national defense against Russia and a Russian attempt to quash European civilization, even though the military ultimately forced the German government's hand without waiting for a Russian declaration of war. Somewhat ironically, given our discussion here, Bernstein, too, was among the majority socialists in early August 1914 and nurtured no doubt at all concerning the alleged Russian war guilt. Same as today. Hmm. Oh boy, what a parallel. And that was just prior to World War I, the war to end all wars. Okay. So it happens again. First time as uh, history and second time as farce. Now, as Naaman has pointed out, true, there were some staunch allies of the Jewish community, motivated largely by religion and humanism, but there was never any movement of sympathy for Jews parallel to anti-Semitism. That was, quote-unquote, going to Naaman. 
what in fact transpired here was called the artificial fostering of animosity towards a mythical philosemitism, which never appeared in concrete form. No, that's not a Zionist tank. It's the balcony, which has been left open. Just a moment. Okay. Now, crucially, this juxtaposition of a hypothetical philosemitism vis-a-vis -a, -vis a real existing <clears throat> anti-Semitism culminated in the suggestion that both needed to be rejected in equal degree. Oh. Uh -huh. This mechanism and the logic behind it, far from being questioned by Bernstein's line of argument, could in fact only be reinforced reinforced by the analogy that he now introduced. After all, he now placed what was, to his mind, an illegitimate form of philosemitism on a par with an actually existing self-styled ideological and political movement, and, what is more, he placed it in on a par with a specific self-styled ideological and political movement that was the object of a long-standing enmity on the part of European radicals and socialists. Hmm. Not so much of an en en enmity, like an enemy for Bernstein. It seems rather significant that Bernstein's text was published in mid-May 1893, less than six weeks after the establishment of the Zentralverein Deutscher Stadtberger Jüdischen Laubens, oh, Central Association of German Citizens of the Jewish Faith, on the 26th of March of that year. Born of the insight that German Jewry needed to articulate its own interests in a manner that went beyond mere opposition to anti-Semitic propaganda, the Centrale Verein soon established itself as a dominant, though never uncontested, voice of mainstream German Jewry prior to 1933. Perhaps Bernstein felt that with its inauguration, pan-Semitism had finally become a real existing movement like pan-Slavism. Should this assumption be correct, we would obviously need to reconsider Bernstein's motives for writing the article. Perhaps its main concern was that the philo-Semitism discourse, as it stood, might prevent social democrats from appreciating the far more real danger that lay in the pan-Semitism exemplified by the establishment of the Centrale Verein. And this event was in fact what convinced Bernstein that he needed to go public with his concerns. Bernstein went on to explain that anti-Semitism, though an ostensible barrier against socialism, would in fact turn out to be its precursor. Ho, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, 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 ho. The commercial dealings of bourgeois society had become so intricately interwoven that no substantial accusation directed against Jews could be envisioned that would not at the same time apply on a massive scale to non-Jews too. Consequently, and what now followed is truly remarkable, he says, that is Bernstein says, the anti-Semitic propagandists are pushed more and more from ostensible to actual opposition and are eventually genuinely persecuted. Temporarily, the persecuted anti-Semites are social democracy's strongest but inherently least robust opponents. They must either eat humble pie, in which case the masses will abandon them, or draw the logical conclusion from their persecution 
and recognize the solidarity between the exploiters of all denominations and then work directly for social democracy. Hmm. Mehring, as we saw earlier, sought the healthy element within anti-Semitism, primarily in the supposedly duped masses that supported it rather than the functionaries who did the duping. He did not suggest, as Bernstein did here, that the anti-Semitic activists themselves would be forced either to withdraw their claims or become social democrats. Really. At this point, Bernstein's contention amounted to a particularly far-reaching formulation of the assumption prevalent in the party and certainly went far beyond the claims made by Mehring. Now, the philosemitic author of the third publication under review, Eulemann, sought to explain all the Jews' faults merely as an outflow of the centuries of oppression they had suffered. Even, quote, even to the extent that this is the case, and true as it is that the proven faults of the Jews can also be found among non-Jews, Bernstein explained, this cannot do away with the fact that certain unpleasant traits are indeed found more frequently among Jews than among non-Jews, albeit not to the extent claimed by the anti-Semites. Well, soft anti-Semitism. Hmm. Oh, the faults of the Jews. Okay, originally it was written as die den Juden nachgeweisenen Fehler. Fehler means mistakes or, or defects. Aha, uh -huh. Fela. Wow. That means fail in what? They're not complete human beings? That we are not complete human beings? We're not complete Germans? Why? Because they're not Christians? <laughs> really? <clears throat> okay. While formal emancipation might not have fully succeeded in redirecting the Jews into productive professions, it had certainly rendered obsolete any excuse for segregation, quote, for a special solidarity among Jews vis-a-vis non-Jews, opposed to Jewish autonomy, for tribal or racial morality in dealings between Jews and non-Jews. Tribal. That's where the word comes from. It comes from social democrats then. Wherever such separatism was to be found, <laughs> separatism <laughs> sounds like Canada talking about Quebec. <laughs> it cannot be combated forcefully enough. <laughs> Any Jewish <laughs> uh, autonomy is called separatism, and it cannot be combated forcefully enough. This is Bernstein. <laughs> no one will claim that it had disappeared entirely when anti-Semitism emerged but that it was rapidly disappearing is borne out by a wealth of experience. Oh, really? <clears throat> Unquote. The anti-Semites alleged, in, and in many cases apparently genuinely believed, that their anti-Semitism targeted these sorts of separatist Jewish practices. Yet it was, quote, in fact, the most suitable means to facilitate their regression and reignite them. And it is here, above all, that the critique of anti-Semitism anti has to begin. Okay, originally he wrote, In ihr hat sein Kritik von allem einzusetzen. Okay, and this is the beginning of the critique of the anti-Semitism. Okay. <clears throat> there could be no prescription less suited to remedy the maladies it seeks to cure. Hmm. Again, the question arises whether it may not well have been the establishment. Malady, Saki <laughs> malad, maladies, illnesses. Okay, so who's the malady? You know, the Jewish people are the malady? Oh, yeah, man. Okay, I understand. I understand. Again, the question arises whether it may not well have been the establishment of the Central Varein that specifically alerted Bernstein to this most critique-worthy aspect of anti-Semitism, mainly its ability to re regenerate or generate Jewish separatism. Oh. <laughs> huh. 
So <laughs> Jewish separatism is bad, and it's, it's and uh, it's bad, be, uh, uh, and uh, and it was and it's caused by presence of anti-Semitism, not by the presence of a Jewish identity, which is defending its scale, itself against anti-Semitism. So he considers Jewish so-called separatism to be a subset of anti-Semitism. Hmm, strange. Given that he clearly had no intention of letting any anti-Semite outdo him in his opposition to this separatism, he must have found <clears throat> the nascent central Verin most irksome, and its inauguration may well explain why he felt the need to speak out on the matter in a more principled form at this particular juncture. It is hard to see how Bernstein's line of argument in, quote, Das Schlagswort and der Antisemitismen, unquote, should have been any less ambiguous than Mehring's habitual comments. When Mehring asked him about this article, Kautsky replied on the 12th of June in 1993, quote, ultimately, I am convinced that your stance and Bernstein's are not, in fact, all too different. Your differences strike me as being primarily of a formal nature. Hmm. Unquote. Nor, for that matter, did Kautsky himself venture to use this opportunity to air any misgivings of his own about the philosemitism discourse. <laughs> Interesting the degrees of anti-Semitism that exist. Okay. Uh, so let's leave it with that. I'll do part three tomorrow. This is the end of part two. Bye for now. Bye for now, and we continue this very intricate, complex question, which even Jewish people don't understand. Bye for now. And we continue on the struggle for Buddhism against Zionism, which is evident and evidently necessary task before us all at this time.